Hello, my name is Neil Davidson, and I'm the founder of Raw Umber Studios. Welcome to another online portrait drawing session. This video mimics the structure of a regular life drawing class. We'll show you three photographs on the screen, one for 10 minutes, one for 20 minutes, and one for 30 minutes. And it's your job to draw the photograph that you see. Lizette Dinghamers will be joining us. She'll be doing a demonstration in the bottom corner of the screen and giving hints and tips. Once you've finished, don't forget to post your work to Instagram and hashtag it with hashtag raw umber life. Right, let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome to another Rambler video. This week I'll be drawing Patrick and some of you requested that I spoke about the visual features a little bit more and tried to break those down. So that's what I'm going to try this video. Now as per usual I'm going to start by placing him on the paper. Now because this is a side view it's going to be almost a perfect box. But he's not entirely straight. His chin is a little bit higher than the back of his head. And the way you can see that is following, for instance, the brow to the top of his ear. Or even better, the corners of his eyes, so the bottom of his eye sockets, to the middle of his ear. That's usually the midpoint on anyone's face, so that's actually a better measurement. But you can follow all kinds of horizontal sort of measurements, like for instance the bottom of his chin, you can also see that going up. And first I'm going to take you through the general measurements of a face. So one important thing is the midpoint of the side of the box that will be where the ear will be behind. Another important uh, measurement is the free fur to so the bottom of the chin, to the bottom of the nose, to the top of the brow. People who have done a few videos probably know these measurements by heart by now, but these are very, very important because they're usually on most people, that's where those features will be located. Next, I'm going to sketch out the front plane of his face. So you can see that from the chin to the tip of his nose, there's a certain angle. And the tip of the nose to his forehead, there's a certain angle. And this is different on everyone. And so it can say quite a lot about the likeness. Since we also know where the ear is located, and that midpoint on the sides, we also know that the jaw will be in front of that. Of course, it's not a perfect 90 degree angle. It usually sort of slightly offsets. So you can imagine the bottom of the, the jaw sort of like offsets by about 30 degrees and the other side as well. So it's really useful to have an imaginary horizontal or vertical line and then see how that angle differentiates from that. Now back to those one thirds, the bottom of the nose and the top of the brow. If you take these through and you follow that sort of horizontal line, you can see that the bottom of the ear lines up and the top of the ear lines up as well with those two measurements. So the ear will be behind that midpoint and in between the brow and the nose. And again, this is for most people. It's not actually for everyone. It's also important to note that the ear is also offset by a 30 degree angle. So it's actually tilted back a little bit. This is also why straight lines are so important when you're doing the initial drawing. It's because it's very easy to see these angles much more easy than if you do a big curve, for instance. So let's look at the eye socket. If I look at the front of the eye socket, it goes to about halfway to the nose. And again, you can see a slight angle if you look at the brow to the bottom of the eye socket. It roughly goes towards the corner of the jaw. Another thing that's important to note is that most of the time the eye socket will be three times in the length of the face in between the ear and the front of the brow. Now taking that bottom of the eye socket, if you follow that along past the ear, that will also be where the bottom of the skull starts. And from there we can just sort of round up the skull. And again, this is just a general sort of measurement. I'm not actually looking at the model that much at this stage. I'm just trying to draw a skull and then put his features on top. And I just want to show you how the skull actually works. So from that bottom of the eye socket, you actually have a sort of box that goes to the bottom of the nose. And that is the zygomatic arch. It goes all the way to the ear hole, straight into that ear. From there, you get the teeth protruding about one third down from the nose. And then you've got the nose actually sort of sticking out. The nose bone usually goes to about halfway the nose. And you can feel it on yourself as well. 
Finally, the bone of the chin will also be one third, but now one third from the bottom of the chin. So this is pretty much everyone's skull. Of course, the differences will be how tall versus how wide, how much the nose sticks out, how much the uh, mouth sticks out. So it's useful to look at these big lines first, sort of establishing the shape of somebody's skull. And the reason why it's useful and very important to know the anatomy, because it's a lot easier to put, for instance, a nose on top when you already know the rough position, you know where the bone is located, you know a lot of the big angles of the front of the plane of the head. Now for the mouth, of course the lips sit on top of the, the teeth, so you can sort of start finding where it should be, going from the corner of the nose to the corner of the mouth, that's a nice line that has a particular angle to it, depending on the person, that's very useful. And if I sort of like roughly imagine that's where the teeth would be, you can imagine the lips sort of laying on top. The top lip will usually stick out a little bit more than the lower lip, but this just depends on somebody's anatomy. And as a general guideline, you can look at the lip being one third from the bottom of the nose down and the bottom of the chin being one third as well. So you can divide that first third in the, of the face into three thirds. Now a little bit about the lips and how they generally, the volume sort of generally work. Usually you get the philtrum, so a little bit of a, a sort of heart shape at the front of the lip. Then it sort of goes down towards the corners of the mouth and the corners of the mouth are usually more horizontal. But this depends on the person. The bottom of the lip actually has two sort of round forms, both on the sides of the corners of the lips. And they then connect at the bottom with a little horizontal sort of line. And that's usually also where you get a little bit of shade, because that's where the lips protrude the most. Okay, so we're at the end of the 10 minute pose. I'm gonna speed it up really quickly just so you can see how adding the hair and all that sort of stuff on top of the skull will make it look 
like him. And then we're going to go for a straight on pose for the 20 minute pose. All right, so here we are for the 20 minute pose and this time we're going to look at the measurements from the front and I'm going to try and explain a little bit more about the nose and maybe about the eye socket depending on time. So again, placing him on the page where I want him and then straight away putting in the center line and that's the main line from the forehead to the middle of the nose to the middle of the chin. Again, dividing up the face into thirds and also looking for the half and you can see that the width of his face is pretty much two thirds of his um, length of his face. And again, this is different for everyone. Some people might be, have a wider face, some people may have a more narrow face. So we know that the nose is the bottom third and the brow is the top third. And we also know that the cheekbone at the middle of the face is the widest point. So again, looking at those angles and how they are different from vertical and then putting those in. Now looking at that midpoint, we know that's where the corners of the eyes will be in this pose. And his ears, just like in a 10 minute pose, will be in between the brow and the bottom of his nose. And these lower sort of squares next to the nose will be where his cheekbones are. And the top half of that sort of halfway point between the nose and the brow will be the eye socket. And what I like to do is just sort of shade something in, almost like he's wearing sunglasses, just so I know that it's a receding plane. Next, I'm going to draw in the wedge shape of the nose, which as you can see, starts at a narrow halfway the eye socket and then gets more wide towards the nostrils. When drawing in the lips, you can again divide that lower third up into three thirds. And then you've got the first third, which is a block of the chin, the second third, which is the lower lip and the shape beneath the lower lip and the top third, which will be the top lip. And I'm going to be drawing the top lip of the same sort of um, general lip shapes that we spoke about in the 10 minute pose. So a sort of heart shape that sort of dips down into the middle, then the sides of the lips and then the corner of the lips that sort of goes up again. And if you want to know how wide someone's, uh, someone's lips are, you can line that up with what you know of, this, of the nose and of the eye sockets. Is it halfway the eye socket? Is it maybe near the corner of the eyes? And that's really, really useful. Now something to know about lips is, is that actually the whole area of what we call the muzzle, but sounds a bit stupid, but it's sort of a barrel shape. So the front of the lip will be further out than the corners. The corners sort of retreat into the sides of the face. So what that means if I draw that out is that you can see that the, the top of the lip is further out than anything else in terms of the lips. You can imagine it turns round like that. Or that that whole area of the, the corners of the mouth to the chin is sort of like a barrel that sort of rounds off. 
And why this is important is because it will make your drawings look less flat if you know that, because you know that then the corners of the mouth will be receding more than the tip of the mouth. So the tip of the mouth usually has less shade and the corners of the mouth are usually darker. And this gives your drawing some some qualities that make it look a little bit more like there's a form there and it's just not a flat shape. Okay, moving on to the nose. What you usually get is the wedge shape in the bottom that sort of starts off a little bit more narrow at the beginning of the nostrils and then gets wider at the widest point of the nostrils, which is sort of in line with the tip of the nose. At that halfway mark of the nose, that's where the bone will stop and the nose will start to widen. The very tip of the nose is actually a little bit of cartilage and it will connect to the top of the lip, so the philtrum, the two sort of little lines that go from the top points of the lip to the middle of the nose. And it will usually have a little shade of its own. One thing that's important to not get confused about is that the whole bottom area of the nose is a plane that's going towards the floor. So even if you do see darker bits near the nostrils and you do see lighter bits where that sort of the tip of the nose sort of comes out a little bit more, it's still important to make sure to shade the whole thing down because it is still all in the bigger picture of things. It's all still receding and turning away. And then you can just put a bit of an accent in if you want for the nostrils, for instance. But very quickly that can start looking like two black holes. So what I usually do is once I've put these sort of details in, I will go over and just shade everything down. Usually at the side of the nose you'll have a slightly more clear boundary where you can see the, the bone sort of protruding a little bit and then the softer boundary as you get to the wider part of the nose. Now getting to the eye sockets, I've already shaded it down a little bit. Um, that midpoint of the nose is also the bottom of the eye socket and that is where the eyeball is located. And the eyeball sort of goes to the lower ridge of the eye socket on the top to the lower ridge of the lower half of the eye socket. So it sort of sits in between. And it's about one inch on average. On, of course, on an, ad on an adult and a child that would be slightly different. So I always think of this as giving him John Lennon glasses. Now, it's important to know where the eyeball is because obviously the lid lays on top of this. So it has to curve with that eyeball. And what usually happens is the lid, the top lid is a little bit more mobile. It's a little bit bigger as well as the lower lid and it usually has the highest point about one third in whereas the lower lid usually is a little bit straighter and the lower point is one third out. 
so it's a bit of an asymmetrical almond shape. Now you can start taking out the light. So of course he's got a little bit of an overhanging sort of eyelid that catches quite a lot of light on the on the on the top lid. So actually his top lid is sort of obscured because he's got the hooded eye. So that catches a lot of light. Once you know where the eyeball is, you can see where you should be shading because it makes a lot more sense on little shapes. Now when it comes to the pupil, I will do a video on expressions next week, but one thing that is important to know for now is that the pupil always sort of is attached to the top lid, unless there is some surprise. So if I do that the opposite way, you can see he gets a bit of a crazy look in his eye, it doesn't look quite right. But if I hang it the opposite way, so I hang it from the top lid, it looks a lot more relaxed. And it's a good idea to just draw a perfect sphere first and then just delete everything you don't need. That way you know where it's located in the eyeball and you can copy that on the other eye because of course if one iris looks one way then the other iris will be also in the same place. So that being said about the features and getting a little bit more in depth in them, I also want to show you that this actually does not a lot for the likeness. I've spent a lot of time on the features now, still doesn't look anything like him. What actually makes someone like look like someone is the shape of their head. So the way their skull is shaped, the way their hair sort of sits on top of that. And that's also why you can recognize your friends from the back of their head or from a small picture. And I'm just going to show you that by adding some shapes around the features and you can see how much that changes the likeness. Because often I find that everyone has the tendency to focus on features because that's naturally, you know, it's important for us socially to know what's going on there. But in fact, the likeness is not as important, it's not as reliant on the features as we think it is.
as you can see. Um, now I've got a little bit more of the shape of his head in. It looks so much more like him. And even without the eye sockets on the right, we could already start seeing a certain likeness. So that's important to keep in mind. Now for the rest of the pose, I'm just going to draw the other eye in, in the same technique. In the meantime, feel free to ask me any questions in the comments. I'm here if you're watching this live. And otherwise, I'll speak to you in the 30-minute pose. Okay, for the 30 minute pose, there will be a more challenging position. And part of this is because we will be confronted with the front plane and the side plane. So not just a flat sort of side or front view. We'll actually have to make him into a 3D shape. So I'm going to start by placing him on the paper. Again, looking at the way the front plane is angled. And you can see that by following the center line. So you can see his chin is further to the left than the middle of his forehead. And in this case, I've slightly curved the center line because actually I'm following his nose, so his forehead sticks out a little bit more. 
Next I'm filing that midpoint as well as the two one thirds. Sorry, the three thirds. And I'm just making some adjustments to my center line that are more in line with what I see happening from the bottom of his nose to the middle of his chin, from the bottom of his nose to his forehead. So this will be the front plane and we can use the same measurements that we used in the other video in the 20 minute pose for the front plane. So again, that halfway mark will be the bottom of the eye sockets and that top one third mark will be the top of his eye sockets. We can already start working that out. Then we need to know about the side plane of the head and one way to do it is to measure how wide it is compared to the front plane, which is about halfway. And then look at the bottom of the eye socket to the middle of the ear and how that line relates. And I see that all more, almost horizontal, so I can just put that in. And once I know one side, I know the other two. Now back to the nose, the wedge of the nose. I first work out what both nostrils are in relationship to the the eye sockets and then put in the wedge following the side of the nose that you can see stick out on the right side. And a sort of rough wedge shape will be enough for still constructing a structural skull slash head and then putting his features on top later. Next for his eye sockets, I'm going to put the eyeball in, so going from the bottom of his cheekbone and then placing the eyeball on top of that, not quite touching the top of his cheekbones, because that's where the brow will be. And you can see that on the right side, it's slightly overlapped by the nose there. And I know it looks a bit funny at start, but it's just useful to know about volume. So you draw something that actually feels like it has some volume rather than something flat. Now with the cheekbones and the, and the side of the, the head actually goes in towards the corner of the eye there and then comes out where the cheekbone is and then goes in towards the chin. Then finally the forehead sort of curves back as well. And this is also on the other side so we can find the widest point of the cheekbone on the left side of the front plane of the head going in towards the chin. And then for the side plane of the head we can start finding the ear using that same mechanism that we used before. Trying to find how it relates to that top of the brow versus the bottom of the nose. And I drew a cross because that's where um, that's a really easy way to find the midpoint of a a um, plane. The cross will really find the middle. And I realize this is a lot more tricky, and I of course I go through it uh, quite quick. So I would say if you still have some questions about the measurements, have a look at how my how to draw a head video. Um, it's on this YouTube channel. It, it goes into this. A little bit more in depth but this video I'd like to um, especially for the 30 minute pose get into a little bit more detail in terms of the features of course if you'd like some more guidance on all the big measurements feel free to ask me anything in the comments Okay, so next I'm going to work on that mouth area and again remembering that it sort of sticks out a little bit and it's both one third, you've got a one third of the block for the chin, that one third of the division between the lips. And now every feature has had a little bit of attention and I know the rough forms, I'm going to start breaking them down. So first going in towards the eyes putting the top lids in first and making sure that they follow that sphere of the eye that I put in. And 
And of course, if the inner corner is at a certain place in one eye, you have to make sure it follows that on the other side. And again, following that general sphere of the eye of the lids. And I like to think of drawing as sculpting a little bit. I'm trying to sort of see the forms that underlie everything just because I found that that helped me so much with drawing uh, rather than just copying shapes. Even though that's a really, really good exercise as well, which I addressed in a figure drawing if you have a subscription. I think that was two weeks ago. And there's definitely two camps on this. There's some people who say you should just draw what you see and only the shapes and forget about what you actually uh, know there to be there. And then you've got other people who say, no, you really need to know the forms. and need to figure out what and how to draw a, a generic feature and then draw the shapes that you see on top. And I don't know, I kind of just try both ways I found both ways to be really helpful so sometimes I'll just draw the shapes especially if it's a little bit if I've got a bit more time that's really really useful and then other times I also figure out the forms underneath and I find the combination to be really really helpful okay now I'm just figuring out that side plane of his head and how it sort of shapes following the big planes that we already plotted out a little bit for instance side of the forehead there and like it's important to get the shape of the head right so very quickly I'm trying to get his hair and his skull sorted. One thing that's important with hair is to make sure that it never lays flat on the skull so I always make sure I've got the skull sort of sketched out and then give the hair a little bit of volume on top otherwise it will just look like glue like someone's just painted hair on top of the skull and of course it has its own little volume as well. Now I'm going to sketch out the lips going from the corners which are in line with each other sort of going up towards that midpoint that sort of sticks out a little bit. And now I've got the general idea, I'm going to start making these shapes his shape. So I'm going to look at the eyebrow and think, right, does that eyebrow need to come down? How close is it to the eye exactly? Um, is it really that dark everywhere? And this should really help with making him look less generic and more like actually him. And this is sort of where that comes in, where you start thinking about shapes rather than what you know should be there, the volumes. And for blending, I personally really like using a little acrylic brush, just a watercolor brush. I think it was 25p in an art shop. And I like it a lot because you can start blending really, really easily. But you can also use a stump, your finger, or a bit of tissue for that. Next I'm going to put in the iris. Again, just a round cylindrical shape. Or I should say a sphere. And making sure that it's positioned on the eyeball in the same way on both uh, eyes.
And then I left the eyes alone. I always try to work on one thing, push a little bit further than work on next. And I think here I realized that actually the nose I made a little bit too long. Like I said, the third sort of measurements are an indication. And it's good to just sort of generally put something in and then look at the actual person and how they differ from that idealization. And in this case, his nose is actually a little bit shorter. So I'm just going to bring that up a little bit. I'm putting in the shapes of the nostrils and the tip of the nose like we spoke about in the 20-minute pose. Now, of course, because I've brought his nose up, his lip and chin will have to follow. So I'm just bringing those lines up. And this is one of the reasons I personally really like working a little bit here and a little bit there. It is because often, well, I'm not... I, I, find, I don't think I've got a very amazing eye. So I find that... If I do a little bit here and a little bit there, that still leaves me room to change things and not spend half an hour on the lips and then realize, oh no, I've got to change those. So this way I try to push everything a little bit at a time and every time I see a drawing mistake, no harm done because I've only spent a few minutes on it. Okay, so now I've got most of the features roughly in. I'm going to do some shading, some general shading of the face. I think last week I did a brown paper uh, portrait. And I spoke about how you could also sort of take the highlights out with a rubber if you didn't have brown paper. Well, that's what I'm going to do in this pose. So I'm going to give everything a little bit of a smudge. So it's a little bit dirty, the paper, and then I can take out the highlights with my rubber. And you can see I'm using the brush to smudge everything a little bit, including the lights.
and now with my putty rubber I can start taking out the highlights and I find this really really fun to do it's really quick and it sort of gives a really nice effect in my opinion so I almost always work this way either on brown paper where I work from the, the general gray or brown uh, mid-tone and then I sort of add highlights using the chalk or like this on white paper where I will smudge everything and then pull out with the rubber. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the eye socket now, just smudging the general vicinity of the eye socket. A lot of people, for instance, think that the white of the eye surely must be white, but actually it's in shadow most of the times because the top lid will cast a shadow on that white of the eye. So even though it's a lighter local color, it's actually more of a gray than a bright white. So I like to just use my brush to sort of smudge most of that area and then pick out the lights using my rubber. And you can see that I did that on the lower lid and it looks a lot more bright and clear. And while I do this, I always keep that sort of egg shape, that spherical shape of the eyeball in mind, always trying to render it so it looks round. And this sort of rendering phase is actually not as quick as most of the drawing. I could spend hours on this. When I was studying, we uh, did four week poses, so three hours a day um, for five days a week for four weeks. And I would spend hours and hours just rendering and that can really make or break a drawing. So if you've got some extra time, just Keep going over it, keep slightly turning something, slightly pulling out the highlights, changing the shape, and it can really make a difference. So I'm going to keep doing this for the remainder of the pose. I'm going to keep adding small lights and moving things, softening things, and then pulling out the shape again. And maybe work on the nose and working on various features. And in the meantime, if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask me in the comments. Any suggestions for future videos, anything that you'd like me to focus on, please let me know. Lastly, for all of you who may want to get a little bit more time on a drawing and spend a bit more time rendering, like what I'm doing now, I am doing a bark 
course on the subscription and in that i'm going to take you through a drawing from start to finish so that might be useful if you've got a subscription to have a look at those videos i go a little bit more in depth on these principles
Okay, so that's it for the 30 minute post. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully I will see you next week. Thank you for taking part. Don't forget to photograph your work and post it on Instagram and hashtag it with hashtag raw umber live. I'd like to thank Lizette Dingermans for drawing along with us today. And you can download the photographs you've seen in this week's session from the link I'm about to show you on the screen. You can follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to like this video if you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Goodbye. We run free portrait drawing sessions every Sunday at 2 p.m. and figure drawing sessions every Wednesday at 8 p.m. We're now offering a raw Umber subscription where you can watch all our figure drawing sessions, past, present and future, for under £10 a month. See our website for more details.